Way back in 2005, two brothers set off on a road trip that would save the world and change television. Daniel and Billy Baldwin. No, no, that, no, that's a d- different road trip. For 15 seasons and 327 episodes, Supernatural took audiences on a wild ride of family, fate, and faith with a rocking soundtrack and a seriously cool car. But that was then, Bobbo, and this is now. And yes, the show has quote-unquote ended, but we're not quite done with the journey. No, we're not. And that's why we're watching it all over again, or for Rob and me, for the first time, diving deep into every episode of Supernatural with the fine folks who made it. And we're taking you along for the ride. Whether you like it or not. I'm Rob Benedict. I played Chuck Shirley, a.k.a. God. Uh, spoiler! Yeah, it is a bit of a spoiler, but hey, spoilers are fair game here. Ah, uh, fine. And I'm Richard Spate Jr., and I played the Trickster, also known as the Archangel Gabriel. And I did a little bit of Loki work in there. Okay, you know what? We're running out of time. Okay, well, we'll be talking about the entire series, so whatever we say, accept it. You've been warned. So buckle up and settle in. Because this, my friend, is Supernatural, then and now. Hey, everybody, I'm Rob Benedict. And I'm Richard Spate Jr. We are talking about season two, episode three. It's called Bloodlust, Robbie. Bloodlust, which is also the name of my uh, high school band. No. Really? No. I thought it was just Lust. No, it was just Blood. Hey, everybody, don't forget to like us on iTunes and Spotify. You know, five stars equals two full beards. Yeah, go ahead and give us five stars. You know, you want to, it's time to do it. Pull the trigger. And, uh, and share uh, stories of our show with your friends via reposts on Instagram and Twitter. And get the word out there. Yeah, be sure people who love Supernatural know about this podcast so they can love it too. And now for episode three of season two, Bloodlust. Baby is back. Baby is back. Baby's got back. Baby got back. <laughs> Baby's got trunk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's fixed and the boys are headed to Red Lodge. Montana to investigate reported decapitations and cattle mutilations. Gross. Once there, they pose as weekly world news reporters and interview the sheriff. Sam and Dean head to the morgue to inspect the bodies and discover that the victims are vampires. Oh, man. The brothers go in search of the vampires next and in the process meet Gordon Walker, another hunter. However, Gordon focuses on vampires. He tells the boys he knows their reputation, but he's a solo operator and he leaves. But Gordon has tracked down a vampire and attacks it. Yeah. However, the vampire overpowers him, and Sam and Dean are there, and they rescue Gordon, and and Dean uh, quite violently kills the vampire. Well, is there a nonviolent way to kill a vampire? Apparently not. I guess you got to kill him with kindness. Him. Right. Mm. But he does. He does it, and then Sam kind of notices. Boy, Dean seems a little unhinged. I think that's the easy for Sam to say, standing far away from the vampire while it's getting killed. Yeah, well, someone had to hold on to Gordon while the vampire was killed. Somebody had to cling to Gordon. (laughs) Gordon offers to buy the boys a drink. Sam decides to head back to the hotel, not really loving what's going on there. Leaving Dean and Gordon at the motel, Sam calls Ellen at Harvell's, who tells him that Gordon is nothing but trouble. That's kind of nothing but trouble. She says, "Not that's kind of a funny scene too." She's like, "Oh yeah, no, he's great. Oh no, stay away from him." (laughs) <laughs> um, back at the bar, Dean hears Gordon's backstory about why he hates vampires. They bond over being hunters. And Sam is suddenly kidnapped and taken to a vampire nest. Sam thinks he's done for. However, Lenore, the vampire, explains that they don't kill people. They drink animal blood, which explains the uh, cattle being slaughtered. Exactly. They want to be left alone and have the right to live. Sam is let go. He tries to convince Dean that these vampires aren't evil. Dean doesn't buy it. There's also several head of cattle outside the uh, the <laughs> barn trying to convince Sam otherwise. Uh, no, they should be killed. <laughs> She's a liar. <laughs> They're not good Sam. vampires. She's a liar. They go to Lenore's house. There they find Gordon torturing her. They get in a fight with Gordon. He wants to kill all vampires. He pulls a knife on Sam and cuts him, hoping this will drive Lenore into a thirst frenzy. However, she controls herself. This seems to convince Dean that these vampires may be reformed. Dean pulls a gun on Gordon. Sam unties Lenore, and she's able to escape. They brawl with Gordon, tie him up, and leave. Dean wonders if they've killed anything that hasn't deserved it as the episode ends. All right. So here's my... I'm diving into my review. I thought the whole theme of this episode was super weak. I uh, I think, obviously, Sterling is awesome. The acting is great. The action's great. Ty Olsen's in there, and it's like... I thought the reveal of the fangs, like you push the button and the gums, and the fang oh, cool. comes out. Yeah. Super cool effect. Uh, I just thought the idea of, hold on, maybe some monsters are good, was a real weak huh. uh, theme. Oh, i um surprised at your harsh take. I, uh, I It just seems so out of the blue. I mean, like, we're watching these episodes back, back, back. All of a sudden, 
mm-hmm. apropos of nothing. Mm-hmm. And Sam's not even the one who's been studying, de- you know, the monsters as much as Dean has. Mm-hmm. And suddenly there's some moral code that has yet to be ever spoken of or introduced that if a creature is slaughtering things, but not the other thing that it's supposed to slaughter, meaning the vampires are eating the cattle in the town, might be ruining the farmer's livelihood, but as long as they're not eating people, it's okay. They're vampires. And also right. they could turn at the drop of a hat. Right. <clears throat> well, I, I guess I, I, just talking about it now, I, 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 my thought, my counter to that would be that the, the greater issue that we're talking about is just that the, the boys are coming to terms with who they are and trying to figure out their own identity now that dad is dead. And, and that includes like, are we, are we, are we good or are we sometimes evil? Are we killing the right things? Who deserves to die? It's kind of that. And uh, just because something is not like us, do they deserve to die? I think that that was sort of the, the theme there. I don't know. It just seemed, I totally hear what you're saying. And I actually think you're, you've said it very well. I just don't, I just think that theme think is the out of the blue. Said it well, yeah. well I, because I think what you said about them trying to figure out who they are without their dad is 100% right. They're trying to, what does it mean to be men now without a dad? What What right. is our true north? What is our right. purpose? What is our job? How do we do it? And how do we, how do we create our own moral code? Because right now, all right. we know is dad's moral code. Right. And so I think that's why this episode is necessary for the, for the Bible. To get the conversation started, maybe, but I think that the it's such a, an abrupt 180. Like, Gordon's story of why he, when they're like, I had to kill my sister because she's a vampire, is, and they're like, what? Like, they look down on him for that. And you're like, screw you guys. If, like, that's, that's the, you know, he basically saved her from being a monster. You know what I mean? Like, she had, it, 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 he wasn't saying my sister was a vampire and she was only eating turtle meat. Like, she became a vampire he was a mercy killing i'm sure that was really hard for him to do it seemed like a weird thing to judge him for you know what who, i mean who eats turtle meat is people that a love, thing people love turtle meat who, who loves turtle meat but he, turtle soup is the thing i guess so i have a cat named turtle yeah but you don't eat her no i wouldn't wouldn't dare which is why i don't want my cat anywhere near sterling my biggest problem with this episode was there are a couple of like really long talky talk scenes that it just felt just really long talk talk scenes. And uh, you kind of wanted it to like, you know, I was like, wow, this is a really long scene. Now, I thought that uh, Bob Singer, who directed it and, and the way Serge shot it, it really did a good job of sort of trying to cut that scene up. It just went shots. But uh, it's tricky to have a long, you know, just that like that scene at the bar with Sterling K. Brown and, and, and Dean. Went yeah. on for a while. Well, I, I, you know, you touched on one thing. I, I think it's phenomenally well directed and phenomenally well shot Agreed. and phenomenally well acted Agreed. by obviously our guys. But Sterling Brown comes Sterling in. Sterling K. Brown is so good. Knocks and, and the leather off the ball. You I was know? really hoping we could get him for this podcast, but he's a busy man. and We, we couldn't quite get it. His schedule didn't work out. But. Uh, he just seems to me to like a really good fella. He just seems like a good dude. You you got a chance to meet him, I hear. Oh, I met him well, briefly, yeah, and it couldn't have been nicer. But all of those things elevate, like Sterling's, you know, fantastic performance, Serge's great work, Brad's great work, and Bob's mm-hmm. amazing directing mm-hmm. all elevate mm-hmm. this story that I thought was built on a weak premise. That doesn't mean I'm right, by the way, because I know plenty of people, it's not like I think it's a poorly done episode. I think the episode is done very well. I just think the premise of this of the story is weak for yeah, me. Yeah, I hear you. I know I hear you. Um, yeah, I think at the at the end of the day, I was thoroughly taken with the performances and with the direction and the, the way it was shot. But I, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not like my top five episodes or anything. But uh, yeah, I did, it felt honestly, because of Sterling K. Brown's, what he goes on to become... It's nice in retrospect. It feels like a special little episode, you know, and yeah. and it, and like you said, Ty Olson and also um, um, a- Amber Benson, who was uh, really big at the time because she was on um, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which I thought was a, a interesting little wink um, that she was a vampire hunter on Buffy, and here she is as a vampire. Oh uh, yeah! Wow, yeah. cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give it. <sighs> Because I, uh, yeah, I hate to be this guy. I'm going to go with Elvis Mutton Chops. Oh, all right. Um, I'm going to give it a Sterling K. Brown goatee. Solid move. I like that. I like that. I like what you did there. Sterling I like what you K. did there. Bro T. You, you gave it the Sterling K. Brown. We can just call it the Sterling K. Brown. The Sterling K. Brown. That's what I got. Um, great. You got a, an Elvis and a Sterling K. Brown. Yeah. 
So we have such a treat. It doesn't stop there, guys. We've got cinematographer Serge Laudisseur, who we've had before, but he's coming with another returning guest, but never they've never been together on our show. Camera, a camera operator, Brad Creaser. Uh, they're both dear friends of ours, just wildly successful and talented at what they do. And here's our conversation with Serge and Brad. First of all, is this the first time you guys have seen each other since the show wrapped, or have you seen each other other times? No, we um, we went out for dinner. Sarah's was in Vancouver um, in April, wrapping up his apart his apartment. Was it April? Yeah, yeah, end of April. Yeah, doesn't seem April that April twenty something, twenty seven or something. Wow. Okay, well that's great. It, it must have been a cool reunion. You guys have been, you know, spending every waking moment together for fifteen years, and then it was an abrupt end with the COVID factor of it all. That had to be a pretty cool reunion. Yeah, no, it was great. It was uh, really great to, to get together and talk about the old days. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's the dream team. I mean, uh, you know, for our listeners, we have the DP of the show in Serge, and Brad was the first camera operator for nearly every episode, minus just a few. Yeah. So it's just a great, and, and, you know, obviously these two positions work hand in hand. And uh, so it's great to have you guys together on the podcast. Thank you so much. So, Brad, you were you started on episode what twelve? Uh, the Benders, which was I think fourteen. Fourteen, yes. But I think the numbers got switched in in right. airing order. But on, it was January of uh, two thousand six. A lot of people who watch the show in great detail, reviewers, historians, they call episodes one through thirteen the best ever. And then there's a slight <laughs> dip. <laughs> Four, 14 forward have like something. It they just specify, feels different. They specify it's just the look. Yeah. It's talking about the look well, of the show. It's just something the look of one the of the framings. cameras. The other camera, like if the yeah. off angle camera is in the pocket. But that, <laughs> that, that was something that, that Maddie Titchener and Robin were always on about. They go, oh, oh, Jim Wallace, how we missed him because Jim was the first <laughs> operator before me but those jerks <laughs> i know it kind of went downhill from there but who knew it was you know somehow got through 14 more seasons um but let's fast forward to season two it's we're talking about season two episode three we're dealing with some vampires dealing with an actor named sterling k brown and uh in the cold open there are a lot of great pov camera work we're running through the woods Brad, did that mean you were you were holstering that uh, camera in in the woods there? I think we did steady cam. I did some of the creepy handheld POVs behind trees and stuff because I'm good at lurking, right, <laughs> and being the monster. But I think I was looking at it again last night, um, and I think it was steady for some of that that running. Yeah. So that would have been exactly. uh, Tim Moynihan, uh, steady cam operator, doing some of that. But yeah, we we had a lot of handheld stuff uh, as well. They're right. great moves. There are great moves there. And then one thing I can tell you is the uh, the scary beats they work. Because looking uh, looking back at this episode was really looking at something new for me. Not that I, you know, getting old and forgot things, but no. But uh, the uh, it was really like watching it for the first time. Mm. And then I was surprised how well those scary beats uh, worked. Yeah, especially when you were talking about the the girl around the the tree. And then yeah. uh, she's got nailed by the uh, the purse, uh, pursuing. Yeah. And so I jumped out of my... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did too. Yeah. yeah, it was fantastic. And there's that moment with Sterling King Brown is following the boys and then he stops and the and you kind of, and then he turns, you think someone's going to be there, but no one's there. Then he turns back, then they're there, you know, this is all, this is sort of like, almost like, uh, like fake jump scares were like, huh, oh, there's nothing. Oh, yeah, well, then you know. the camera moving up behind him and then, he, you know, you think that's the POV of the, exactly. the guys coming after him and then he turns. Yeah. Nobody's there. Yeah, no, it was great. It was uh, well or orchestrated and, and uh, of course, directed by our, our dear friend, Mr. Robert Zane. Yeah. That young gun is going to go places. You know what I'm saying? Okay, guys, hold on. We're coming right back. Hey, this is Richard Spate. You know what? It's 2024. It's a brand new year. And I bet you made some New Year's resolutions. And I bet one of them was to eat healthier. Well, you can get cranking on that resolution right now, my friend, with Factor. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, the prep work, the cooking fatigue. I'm getting tired just talking about it. Instead, 
Get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you will have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart this resolution off right. Forget frantic lunch prep and rush dinner making. That stinks. Factors two-minute meals, yes, I said two minutes, are your secret weapon in the new year. You get to fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals all delivered right to your door. It doesn't get any easier than that. And Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep you going no matter what's on the schedule. So I know what you're asking. Rich, how do I tap into this Factor magic? You head to factormeals.com slash SPNTAN50 and use code SPNTAN50 to get 50% off. That's a lot off. That's code SPNTAN50 at factormeals.com slash SPNTAN50 for 50% off. Make that resolution happen now and make it happen at a discount. Fantastic food that's healthy and delicious and delivered right to my door. Now that is how you start the new year off right. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. And now back to the episode. The jump scares work in this story, I think especially going back to that that opening scene, it's really interesting how the the camera wraps around a tree in an interesting way. She moves around the tree. Like Rob uh, Bob Singer had the actors doing some interesting stuff that's logical. Like that makes sense for the character, but it it sort of enabled the camera to do to slide around and for scary things to be happening there. You know, scary things are always happening without the actor aware, but it felt more natural in this episode than some because of the way the actors were blocked to move and the camera kind of countered those moves. So that specific shot of her going up against the tree and kind of sliding around the tree, camera moves with her and then something in the background goes, Voip. you know, it's real quick, real creepy. Yeah, no, it was great. It was it was so well done. Mr. Senor designed some great shots in that episode, so I, I found that. Yeah. Now, what what's a, that in particular, like, you have vampires, that means there's going to be shooting at night. Are there challenges? Are there any advantages to shooting at night? Well, that's the scare. It's, it's a dark show, so night is dark. So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, and then we had quite a, we experienced quite a bit of a, a fright, fright of this also on the, on a couple, at least on that uh, on that show, right? When you're shooting all night long, Friday night into Saturday. Yes. Yeah. It's a bummer that that is as hard as it is because it really does pay off. Like the exterior nights when you're out, literally exterior night and not fabricating it inside. There's a difference. You know, you can just tell. Well, scary things happen in the dark, and there was a lot of night on this episode. Uh, I was going, "Wow, we did a lot of nights." Because <laughs> like, yeah. all the stuff at the sawmill, the forest. Uh, yeah, uh, outside the bo- the bar. Um, yeah, it was, uh, but it it looks great. Like Sarah's, I was watching it again, and, and I was just blown away. The look was just so amazing. We were still shooting film. Um, the desaturation, the 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 timing. It, it just, it was just so. Just the cinematography blew, blew me away. Again, it was so great, great Thank to you. revisit it. So, Brad, what do you what how, how, describe to a listener what you mean by desaturation? Um, kind of the colors we we kind of played down it's a little more muted not black and white but but we're not popping you know reds and blues and you know it, it's all very kind of toned down um you know what a good example of it would be Serge, help me out um, well now you know this is the the look of season two pretty much follows the look of season one those are mm-hmm. the two seasons i like very much in uh, uh, you know in terms of looks uh we came back we f- we came back to it in season four a little bit but those are my two favorite seasons as far as the look in the dark and the desaturation uh one technically we can uh describe that by uh, uh, a chemical process that's called the uh Bleach bypass uh, process. So in, in, it's uh, when you process film, so you skip one step and then it gives you to retain some very, you know, contrasty uh, elements in the, in the shot. So, uh, and then the, your dark and darker and the, the so white gets wider. So, so this is, I was, I was experimenting with, uh, with that at the time. The, uh, there was some other, uh, there was a trend you know, in cinematography, using that uh, uh, the, the the bleach bypass, 
uh, just uh, recall seven is a an, 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 you know an example of that at the time. So yeah, it's a process by which you uh, you contrast the uh, image and you you blow the highlights. So it gives that feeling you know it's almost sometimes that i was re-watching it so it's almost close to black and white but just with a hint of color mm, right and oh yeah cool I, I think it uh it helps you know for the story for the kind of world in which we uh we uh, we were yeah. for sure so i have a question to follow up on that and, and one's a statement rob and i were talking about this sh- a different episode earlier in a different interview and I 100% agree with you, Sarah. Season one and two, the look is phenomenal. Like, I, I know that they came back in and said, hey, it's too dark or whatever at some point. But, man, they should have let you do your thing. Season one and two, the darkness, the desaturation, everything you guys uh, strove for and achieved, it is so cinematic. It is so cool. It elevates everything. It's really a great look. To that well, end. That's the word, cin- cinematic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It elevates TV. Like you, we're watching this on Netflix, right? But you got to remember, these were the kids turning on CW at the time, and there's a you know a hair product commercial in between these you know scary breaks. This is a, this TV, this caliber of show that was being made, was so far above the other products on the air at the time. Mm-hmm. And and again, I think that's the only reason why they probably got in there and got nervous and started wringing their hands and like, uh, we might be too dark because nothing was like this on TV. Right. It, you yep. can't compare this to TV now. You can't look at season two and hold it up and go, well, TV is dark. TV wasn't dark then. Certainly not, not and, anything else on CW. Too, no, and, you know? The, and you know, there was no apps. You, wouldn't wa- you weren't watching things on streaming services. You were watching, you know, and, I, and we're watching the true color pass of it. So it's great on Netflix. I don't know what the, you know, how CW broadcasted if they tweaked any of that at all, but it was, it's phenomenal to watch what you guys uh, achieved early on and, and continue to achieve. But I know that you're, you would have had, you had your way, they wouldn't have messed with your look. You know what I mean? You would have kept your look going. I would have kept going with that. But what we find out, we found out that beginning of season three, I had the words from uh, Eric and the production that they wanted to add to have more color. You know, so to uh, said okay, so and then Eric said, so we don't have the choice but to comply. You know, uh, right? So I said, uh, okay, so then that's why when you start looking at uh, when you look at season three, suddenly it's uh, it's more it's colorful, and then it's uh, I, I, it it works in in a way, but to me it's uh, it doesn't have the doesn't have the taste of the uh, the first two uh, the first two seasons. It one hundred percent works, but I, but. To to my point, to your point, to Brad's point, to Rob's point, there was just a sort of an edgier cinema tone to the first two seasons that that really holds up super well. Yeah. And my question about that, you're talking about desaturation, Sayers, and you were explaining that process. The bleach bypass, is that what it's called? Bleach bypass, yeah. Yeah. When, it, back then, it, this it, is on it's film. It's an emulation of the bleach bypass. You know, it's done in, on, on the, on the co- color timing uh, uh, video. Uh, it's just an emulation. There is no chemical process anymore. It's just an emulation of it. You know, even back then. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. D- no, no. In, yeah. In, in, yeah. in cinema, like, in cinema, in uh, uh, let's say, in Seven and all of these films, so they were really doing the the film thing. But even though we were doing film, the we were transferring it to video, and then in the the timing suite, we were you know emulating the the bleach bypass. There was no oh chemical you know process oh oh that's interesting so here's so this leads to my next question when you were shooting these episodes because i i started directing in in the world of digital so i never directed an episode of supernatural on film maybe this is a dumb question but was there a monitor like were directors using monitors then yes was this lut on there like did it have this color palette on the director's monitor not really because we had like like just an eight inch uh, monitor and uh, so the the look was applied later gotcha so we were trying to you know tweak the monitor a little bit so we can have an idea of of, of the look but the look wasn't baked in the daily so it was uh, it was transferred accordingly to the uh, to the goal we were we were having gotcha yeah we're just coming off a video tap that's on the camera you we just plug in a cable like a BNC, like you would your your TV almost, and run it to the monitor. But they're looking at it on a nine inch Sony 
little monitor. We didn't have the big, you know, 25 right. inch, you know, 10,000 or 25,000 dollar monitors that you see now on sets of villages for. So, uh, so they're seeing what you're seeing, Brad, but you're saying, Sarah, they're doing a little tweaking to try to give it a little bit of the of the flavor of what's going on. But they, they're not doing a full LUT pass or anything like that. No, 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 no. No. And I, I, I'm looking through a reflex mirror spinning. I'm seeing a live image through a camera, not a digital image. I'm seeing a, a, a clear uh, optical image, not a digital. And then when the digital cameras came out, it all became, you know, you're looking at a little video monitor through the eyepiece, not actually through a mirror that's, you know, spinning, that some of the image is going to the film, the other image is going to the eyepiece. If I was to take my eye off the eyepiece, any light coming in from the eyepiece uh, can fog the film. Right. So you can get you can you can exactly, ruin yeah. film if you have light coming in the eyepiece that's not blocked because it's going to hit the film and expose because of the mirror spinning. So it's it's very different from from the digital world. Wow, that's interesting. interesting. One thing I found out looking, uh, you know, I was watching uh, the episode on uh, Prime, you know, Prime Video. Yeah, from, uh, that's, that's where I was too. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. at the end of, uh, I think at the end of uh, 203, there is a teaser for the next one. And this teaser was edited before it was time. And then you can see the color. It was, oh, no. Weird. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You I noticed that. Right, huh? yeah. yeah, I did. Yeah. I was on Prime as well. Yeah. And so that was funny. And then it was there. It was like that at the time, which I didn't like very much because they were you know, somewhere down the uh, the workflow, this did wasn't over wasn't overlooked. Wow. So I said, yeah, isn't something missing there? <laughs> so, wow, interesting. Yeah. Hey, so you know, you mentioned um, Tim, who was doing the study cam work, uh, right? Yes. yes. Moynihan. Moynihan. Um, there's another really cool study cam shot in this episode, in the bar, where the it, it's a and I think it said he came in less Brad, you say you guys had a circle track and a dolly, because it could have been that. But it was when they're all sitting and have a beer and you come around one side of Sterling, you spin around, you keep talking to you keep focusing on Sterling. Sterling kind of points to the guys, the camera goes over, lands in a profile of Dean, and then across Dean to to uh Jared to Sam. It was a really yeah. slick move. I was like, whoa. Yeah, Do, that was two great. Questions. Yeah, that was steady cam. That was Tim. That, that was, was steady. Tim. Okay. Not, so not, here's my question. Sure track. This is a real, I don't know if you'll remember this. So the answer is that's steady cam. That's Tim Moynihan doing his thing. That specific design, that that level of detail, detail of design. Is Bob Singer coming in with that exact plan? Or yes. is it, does he have a broad stroke he will, idea? He will, totally. Yeah. No. Yeah. Bob is um, always gets on a, on the set with a very precise idea of what he wants to do. So right. those shots are exist in his mind before he gets to the set. That's awesome because that was a great shot. That was a, right. such a cool shot. And it's and great. what I love about a shot like that is it's not in a hunting sequence. It's not in a scary moment. It's three guys having a beer, which could be wide tight tighter. I mean, it could be boring, but it's a well. Yeah, what yeah, what Bob does really well too is he sees that that's a really long scene. It's a long talky scene, and he can make it uh, dynamic to look at by, you know, creating yeah, really shots. Cool. Really well done. Yeah. And I'll, yeah, I'll, def- also you have to, these these shots have to be prepped, you know, have to be prepared. And uh, because if you do a, a shot like the one you described, so you go all around, so you see all the walls and you see everything. Right. Uh, like it's almost like a 360 sometimes. So I think it was almost I a 360, Sarah. I think it was like a, you know, you had one slice of pie to work with. Everything else was going to be on camera, you know? Yes. So what it means, it means that every, every, all the lights have to be hung, you right. know? So I can't have anything, almost anything on the ground. So everything has no to be hung. Stand. So this is some, uh, some prep. So there's no way we can do that. You know, oh, okay, let's do that. And then uh, and then it happens in the, the next 20 minutes, you know? No. So you have to, to know in advance what you're doing. And uh, and then prep for it. Now, when you say you have to know in advance and prep for it, would you mean that Bob would come to you a day before and say this is the plan? Or in the camera blocking, is that enough time to be prepared? Like if if Bob walks into that scene, he goes, "Okay, Sayers, this is my move." And is that enough time for you to prepare for that, or did you need to know the day in advance? Well, it, it depends on the extent of the the prep we did before. Uh, at the time, I wasn't participating on the. Uh, because I was shooting every episode, I wasn't participating on the on the on the tech survey. So uh, 
uh, then I knew from the uh, uh, from my gaffer and key grip what the kind of shot Bob wanted to do. And Bob would come to me and said, okay, in this place, I'd like to do that. So I'll make sure with my, my guys that, uh, okay, in this place, guys, we're going to have to hang everything or most of the things. So we right. can, you know, do those, do those shots. So let's say that- for people listening, sorry, Brad, I just want to pause right here and say, for people who are watching and don't know what a tech survey is, a tech survey is where department heads or, or at least representatives from every department go set to set to location to location with the director of the next episode and the director and the first AD describe what's going to happen in these locations so that the department heads can start to prepare what they need to prepare for the day's shooting, which might not be, which might be two weeks away, but it's like the art department measures for the signage and the guys, you know, do engineering surveys to be sure a crane base will fit there. And it's all the, all that starts. So that's what Sayers was referring to when he talked about the tech survey. Yes, uh, go exactly. ahead, Brad. Yeah. I was just going to say, and, and that, I believe, we did that on location in, in the real bar. We, that wasn't a set. That was the one we shot. It was in Maple Ridge, I think, right, Serge? Stinks so that had to be that. prepped in, in a real location, which makes it even more challenging because you're not in a studio set where you have a grid and pipes that you're prepared to hang lights from. You have to make it work right. in, in a practical location, which is, I think, an extra challenge. And, and it was executed masterfully, of course. It is executed masterfully. Do you think there's a benefit? I know the. I know the benefits of working on a set because of everything you just described you can you have control of things but isn't there something to be said for working in practical locations just for the tone and vibe of existing rooms and buildings oh of course and and because you're you're dealing with you know you're looking outside to real life not a not a trans light or a backing or you know uh, a studio wall it's uh you certainly get more more depth and, and realism obviously and you're in a real world also yeah Right. In, in 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 studio, you can achieve that also, but ne- it needs uh, you know skill of a, a lot of people to make that uh, happen to uh, make it look like it's the real thing while it's not. You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, Sterling K. Brown in this episode, uh, we're fans of his, and of course his work on This Is Us uh, has has thrown him into a whole nother celebrity realm um do you remember what it was like to work with sterling well like i said uh, earlier looking looking at this episode was like looking uh, looking at it for almost for the first time but uh, i do recall that uh, sterling was quite a team player and he was great to to work with there's some specifics i don't sure. I don't a long time ago. It's from what 16 17 years ago so, uh, <laughs> I have a fo- follow up question, Brad. What did Sterling have for lunch on day three? <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> no, I'm not Kevin Parks. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Uh, Sterling was awesome. I remember. And of course, there was a, a gag that started happening with, with uh, Jared and Jensen because um, Sterling's character was Gordon, right? So it, was, it became Gordon. So they, Jared <laughs> Jensen was like, Gordon. And Sterling t- took it like a champ, but I mean, he was, he fit right into the, you know, you know what it's like on set, especially with those two mooks. Well, I think they got along well because I, I years later, I, I was uh, at a restaurant with Jared and Jensen uh, in Vancouver, and this is years later. So Sterling is already on This Is Us. He's already becoming a guy, uh, a, a celebrity in his own right. Huge, huge star. Yeah, huge star. And uh, he comes in, he sees Jared and Jensen, and it's immediately like, hey, hug, hug, hug chat, chat, chat. He sits down and then eventually Jensen and I start talking. Jared and Sterling are engrossed in some sort of conversation and they're pulling out photos and they're showing each other photos. And I'm thinking, oh, kids, right? I mean, that's your logical thought. They're showing pictures of their kids. They weren't. They were showing each other pictures of their abs after workout. They're like, dude, I'm lifting this much. I'm lifting this much. I'm like, (laughs) and they're showing (laughs) pictures of like their selfies, their torso selfies. And I'm like, what in the name? Wow. No wonder Sterling fit in like a glove over there. <laughs> both, both, uh, both gorgeous uh, men ex- uh, exchanging uh, gorgeous photos of each other. That's yeah. funny. You know, one thing I realized on in this episode also, you have the uh, the barman at, at the uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the show, uh, first act. It's Ty Olson and Ty, Ty uh, yeah. and will become Benny at some point later, few seasons later. So when yeah. I when I watched mm-hmm. that, I said, "Oh my! Oh, this is this is Ty." It's, I didn't realize that we had him, you know, years before he came to the to the show as a new character. 
Neither and I, did I, I thought, I, I thought yeah. is, is this where we introduced Benny? I'm like, wow, I didn't realize he was that early. And then it's like, then they go, Eli. He's like, oh, he's not Benny. So yeah, it was, <laughs> it was years later, but he was a vampire, which is quite funny. That yeah. later he comes back. And yeah, I was super vampire. confused by that. I like, because it was also long and long enough ago where I, I thought, oh, maybe that guy just looks like Ty Olson. You know what I mean? Like I, I, you know, I, I thought maybe it's just a guy with a similar look. So I paused it and looked it up on IMDb and I'm like, oh my gosh. Is Ty Olson? I had the same. I had yeah. the same. The same reaction. I also looked. On the yeah, and and thought yeah. this. I mean, Sarah's. I thought the exact same thing. I'm like, oh, this is Benny, and they're <laughs> calling him Eli. I'm like, okay, this is not yeah. Benny. And then he's a vampire, and I'm like, I know Supernatural has bought has brought back a lot of actors. Some girl plays a babysitter in one season. Next year, she's a you know flesh eater or something. You know, but I've never. It's never occurred to me, or I never realized that they ha- they brought back an actor playing the same monster, but a different character in that same monster field. Really? You know, yeah. he's a vampire here, and then a vampire later, but a different vampire. Yeah, second time we meet him in Purgatory. So we're we're our type yeah. typecasting Ty Olson as a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was another cameo in this episode too. I don't know if you guys realized. Hold on, hold on. Let me think about it. Cameo. What scene? Uh, in the sheriff's office, when the boys are posing as reporters, talking to the sheriff about the cattle mutilations. Okay. There is a, um, the sheriff's assistant, uh, female, that comes to the door saying, they're ready for you now. He's got a press conference or something. Do you know who that woman was? No. Cheryl Teagues. Mackenzie Ackles, Jensen's sister. What? No way. She, okay. she was in town visiting. She's not in the business. She was in town visiting and... I guess Jensen goaded her into making a little uh, walk on that day we were shooting it. That's awesome. Yeah. So I thought that was a little, there's one of Rob's fun facts. Oh. Fun yeah, facts. exactly. That's a, <laughs> I just checked our fun facts to see if that was in it and it isn't. So that's, there you go. You just, you uh, just trumped the fun facts. Yeah. That's my contribution. That's yeah, great. That was, that was fun. No, it was great. Awesome. It was uh, so it's a family affair even from like season two. Yeah. Oh, cool. There are nice, um, nice moments to be recalled also on, on this episode. So I was in touch with uh, with Bob uh, the last couple of days and I asked him, do you, uh, do you have any special memories that you have about this, uh, this episode? So then he replied to me, he said he had a couple. So I said I was going to talk to you about, uh, about that. Great. And one is the... Uh, uh, it's the shot of uh, Jensen at the very end of, of the show. And then that shot became kind of an iconic uh, image of Supernatural. This is looking back at the camera and there's a flare. And then when we were shooting that, uh, uh, we were ready to do that. And uh, and Brad was saying, uh, if you recall, Brad said, there is a flare. So yes, we'll love it. So let's do it. It's just the flare, the yeah. flare. It's like, yeah, I just have down on my, my notes. It's just the flare. Yeah. It was like, yes. Amazing. One of the best I, moments of the series. <laughs> I remember that shot. I thought that shot was so cool. And, you know, I think people now so much go, oh, let's get the flare, aim for the flare. That was not the style of the time, you know, to like to to reach for flares and that kind of thing. And that was such a cool, dramatic moment. And it, it, it helps. The, uh, it helped happy, Jensen look. Yeah, happy accident. Yeah, a happy accident that looked amazing. Yeah, I bet. And it helped. It helped with Jensen in that moment because he's not. He doesn't look good on camera and doesn't have a very dramatic, you know, stare in that True. moment. So it really helped <laughs> offset his Well, it distracted you yeah. from his face. So you didn't have to look <laughs> at his face. You're like, oh, look at that yeah. nice little, look at that nice little sun ring. It's like a <laughs> rainbow. You can see the rainbow. I mean, oh that's God. man. It's like, so that's a pretty good shot. <laughs> so if you just do that. Um, now, Serge, first of all, thank you for doing our job for us and in, in interviewing Bob. <laughs> and <laughs> <Bob>. <laughs> <laughs> but well, also, you did also um, but... <laughs> um, was that was that flare a result of shooting at a specific time of day? Probably the sun mm-hmm. wasn't so. We're, we're probably we're looking at the at, towards the sun, and then it just flared the lens. And so, in that, you have the choice with the grip to flag it or to let it go. So, in that instance so you make the decision to let it go because right. it's cool yeah yeah you know i tell you that's like a, that's like a, a a grips freedom cry don't flag it let it yeah. go <laughs> there's, there's research uh, uh, <laughs> well, they would be happy to flag it but you just you have to tell them don't 
do it. <laughs> so, and flagging it means yeah. putting up a piece of material that, that would block that flare from happening uh, off the off to the side of the lens. Uh, so, I know you just said this, Sarah, but I just want to reiterate for my own clarification. So, you guys didn't plan for the flare. You just saw that it was going to happen and decided to embrace it. Yeah, that's awesome. That was such a cool shot. It, it's yeah, it's, it became t- one of my favorite. I think of, of the series. Oh no, it's literally, and it, it looks like something. Again, I use. Maybe I'm overusing the term cinematic, but it has that river runs through it sort of epic, you know, sh- mm-hmm. shot yeah. feel. Sure, with a with another, you know, with a Brad Pitt looking fellow. Yeah, and it, it, it helped. He helped the scene a little there, but um, whatever. <laughs> no, this is the kind of situation where you decide you decide you go with it or you don't. So there's still a creative right. choice happening there. So you go with the with that flow or or you don't you flag it or you don't that's the right I, well mm-hmm. it, i mean in this case 100 percent the right choice definitely definitely yeah. the other thing about this episode that i just wanted to throw up because it just seeing it again and almost like you said sirs for the first time that's probably some of the best driving sequences we've done with the impala like the long the long yes. lens coming over the hill the camera car work like we we didn't do that very often and that to me was one of the most the iconic Impala and the boys driving, uh, which we did, you know, insert car uh, and long lenses. Like the whole sequence was was fantastic. And it was all Bob. Bob wanted to get some really, you know, we had great beauty shots. And this is, you know, us physically on a camera car going around them and uh, and and towing them and, and the whole works. I mean, it's time, you know, a lot of time involved in doing that kind of work, but it was it was amazing and, and, and some of the best looking footage so yeah no I it, it looks amazing that. i agree with that because this is the uh, the comeback of the impala right after it has been destroyed at the end of season one so uh, season uh episode one and two so they're re- rebuilding it so that's the finally baby's so back. back on the road yeah you answered my question i was going to say aside from just doing that because it it's a good idea for the show itself it really is thematic because you're bringing a character mm-hmm. back. It's a resurrection of the car, right? I mean, yeah, very so, cool. So he could justify spending that time as a director on those moments because it really was solidifying that baby was not going anywhere. Every time Jared and Jensen died, believe me, they're coming back. And now we've just said the same thing about the car. <laughs> yeah. Set the tone. Uh, Serge, you were saying earlier, you talked to Bob, was there another story outside of the flair story that he wanted to yeah, share? Yeah, there was a moment when we were, um, you know, at the sawmill. So, uh, he said, um, I had, uh, I had a few, uh, shots to, um, I had a lot of shots to design. And he said towards the end of, of the night. So I uh, decided to, uh, uh, do the shot and this, the scene where, uh, uh, the guy's head is cut off by uh, uh, Jen, by uh, Jensen, and uh, by Dean. And so we went about to do that, and he said, "Okay, so what can we do now?" So we turn turns around, and he looks on the on the other side. The sun's almost not, so the uh, the day's about to to break. So uh, said, "Okay, so take, good, we do we, we did that." So that was one uh, one moment he uh, he recalled that he wanted to come oh, yeah. so that was uh, uh you know so coming back to uh, getting back to the uh, frater the uh, thing we were talking about earlier right a long night yeah. after a long night so that was probably one of the last shots uh, we we did on that night when yeah oh is that right right before the, before sun, the sun came yeah. out yeah the sky was turning blue you look on the other side and then it's the days breaking up i think the efficiency of a crew and director are tested on those moments when you like how much story do you have to tell how much daylight do you have or or no daylight do you have left to tell it and how do you efficiently accomplish what you need to accomplish because let's be honest nine times out of ten whatever the plan is gets abandoned for some truncated version of storytelling but how do you still make it cool effective and cinematic and all those things of course you don't do you don't get better than bob singer at something like that you know so and especially episode three. So that means we were shooting kind of uh, probably August or something, August or the end of July or beginning of August. And uh, these the the days they are very long and nights are very short. So you have to maximize your uh, shooting time so you don't get trapped into a kind of situation where oh okay no right finish right. because the the sun's coming up right. That's when it doesn't get dark until like nine o'clock. Vancouver. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, well, guys, uh, we could ca- talk to you all day, but we'll, we'll, we'll let you go. We know you're busy, man. It's Canada and, uh, Day, Rob. We, we just... got to let them go celebrate Canada. <laughs> it's Canada Day. Go, go celebrate. But, um, but no joke. I, we, I, I could have you guys on for every episode to have these conversations. It's just yeah. literally fascinating because, I mean, nobody has an inside scoop more than you guys other than Jared and Jensen. I mean, you two specifically. It's so awesome to hear your stories about h- how these episodes were executed and the nuances, the fun, the challenges. It's just fascinating. So thank you so much. Anytime. Yeah, anytime. It was really, really great to see you guys. And I love talking to you guys too. And it's great to have Sarah's on board too. Well, we're going to do it again. And yeah. we're going to pair you guys up again because it's just too fun. And maybe we'll wrangle Bob Singer in for a trio. It's just too too great. That yeah. would be fun. That would be fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. Okay. Thanks, guys. Hey, this is Jensen. I hope you're enjoying the episode. Uh, but we need to pull over for a second for some messages. And I got to take a leak. Hey, guess what? We're back. What a conversation. I love those guys as individuals, talking to them together. That was one of my favorite interviews we've ever done, bar, bar none. Well, it's it really like a, like I said, it's, it was the dream team, and and having those two together was it's really really cool. I mean, it's literally it's like having you know uh, Jordan and Pippin on. You know what I mean? It's like these these two guys yeah. uh, helped helped to create this this dynasty of a show, and and also f- as a friend of yours, it's fun to see how jazzed you get because I know uh, as a director y- you really geek out at at what they do, and so it's it's fun for me to see you get so so excited about it i really do geek out i know i i I, because i'll see you like open your mouth but i get three more questions in before you (laughs) yeah i i tried to and and none of them by the way are the written questions which i love it's organically happy but uh yeah and then you're like follow up uh and i and i'm going "Uh." but and i said this at the end of the interview and i mean it we got to get those two guys and and bob singer together for an interview because we do because a they all love each other like brothers B, Brad and Sayers were in the trenches together for every episode, you know, episode 14 forward. And then Bob being the pointing of the bayonet for them for directing the most episodes ever and being the voice of the show from the directing standpoint yep. as the executive producer and co-showrunner for so many years. I mean, and he's also so funny. I think it would just be a great, it would be a great episode of this podcast to have them all together. Absolutely. I love what Serge said about how Bob always came, you know, knowing exactly in his head how he wanted it to look and how that informed their job and what they needed to do. And, you know, it's, uh, we take it for granted, but, you know, he, he passed that on to younger directors like yourself. Oh yeah. And not all new directors come in with that sensibility or that talent or that preparation like Bob did and like he's passed on to some of his the people have, that have worked under him and uh, a lot of proteges you know Phil Segrisha is a protege of Bob Singer exactly you know John Showalter you know there's a lot of them so, and yeah. myself included so he has a wide wake of directors who've come in behind him who've learned a lot from his uh, skill and style yeah and it was it was it's it, it was always a pleasure for me to watch that happen and to work uh with it um so it's just great to have those guys on and now we're going to talk about this episode in terms of its mythology. Mythology! 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 It is common in pop culture to have vampires try to be ethical by only drinking animal blood. Those are called vampire nerds. <laughs> or they'd be like vampire vegetarians. <laughs> They're still eating meat. It's a cow. Yeah, but for vampires, they normally eat uh, human blood. But they're like, no, only meat blood for me, only uh, cow blood for me. It's like so. The then they're blood. cowitarians. They're cowitarians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other popular ethical animal blood drinking vampires include Louis in Interview with the Vampire, uh, Edward Cullen in Twilight, and Angel in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Interestingly, I've heard of Louis and Angel. Rob has heard of Edward Cullen. Well, yes, because I've got a teenage girl. I've seen, um, all, I've seen, all, I've seen all those movies. Oh, really? I was making a joke. You have. Okay, there of course. you go. And boy, are they bad. But uh, yeah. Now, what else you got about vampires, Rich? Well, there's a bunch of famous vampires, Rob. Mm-hmm. For example, Jason Patrick in Lost Boys. He's a famous vampire. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, hundreds. So other famous vampires include nope. the Count from Sesame Street. No. <laughs> Count Chocula, who's on the cereal box. And Jason Patrick from Lost Boys. 
Uh, okay. Other famous vampire hunters in pop culture include Abraham Van Helsing from Bram Stoker's Dracula, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Blade, and the Belmont family in the Castlevania video game series. I'm going to add one to that uh, bunch, and that is uh, Guillermo de la Cruz in What We Do in the Shadows. Uh, Harvey Guillen's character in What We Do in the Shadows, the TV show taken from the movie. But uh, yeah, his character is a okay. vampire hunter. As well. I'm going to add to that as well. Any children across the United States who eat Count Chocula, right. the cereal. Yeah. Because vampire I feel like hunter. if you're eating the cereal, in a way, you're hunting vampires. Yeah. Only you're doing it by filling your body with so much malnutrition that you're going to wither and die uh, early say, in your adult years. Yeah, there's I was no going to say they're also, in that cereal. Yeah, they're also candidates uh, for cavities. Yeah. By the way, special shout out to our sponsor, <laughs> Kellogg's. <laughs> Guess we can scratch that one off the list, boys. <laughs> and Dr. Williamson, DDS, <laughs> for your help in keeping clean teeth. Uh, um, now, listen, you know I know a lot about the Balkans. Well, in the Balkan lore of vampires, they believed that vampire hunters were born on Saturdays. They believe someone born on a Saturday can see vampires and they are invisible. Yeah, you and the Balkans. Man, you love your Balkan lore. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> hey, guys, it's time for Fun Fact. Fun Fact. This is the first episode where Sam starts parting his hair down the middle. <laughs> Dude, Sam's hair. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's a crazy moving target. <laughs> that's a fun, that's a funny fun fact. Also, this is the third podcast we've recorded where Richard had COVID. That's true. That's true. And this is the first episode where Dean refers to the Impala as baby. I'm going to go on a limb and say that's where the car got the nickname baby. I don't know. Were you born on a Saturday? I was born at night, but not last night, baby. <laughs> uh, so this is interesting. So Jared broke his hand during a stunt in this episode. The writers wrote it into the next episode, so it would make sense as to why he's wearing a cast. He's actually wearing a cast in the next couple of episodes. He's wearing one in Simon Said, and he wears one in uh, 206 as well. Oh. Yeah. And I noticed that. And at the end of this episode, you can tell it's actually hurting. Like, out of nowhere, he's like, yeah, it hurt my hand. I, 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 like, when uh, she... Weird. When she jumps on him, when the vampire jumps on him and knocks him down, uh -huh. it might have been there. But um, yeah, and he gets in the car. Do you notice that he gets in the car and he, and he shuts it with his other, his opposite hand? Like uh -uh. he crosses over himself to shut the car door. And, it's, and there's no cast on it at this point. He's just holding it all, you know, kind of right. weird. And then sure enough, in Simon Said, he's got a cast on. Wow. I thought for sure he had had a crazy night out or something and something happened, but I think it happened in a stunt. Well, that's what they're saying. I mean, that's what the press is telling us. You know what I mean? That's what the that's what the PR folks want us to believe. Right. Well, here it says what I was saying earlier, that Amber Benson, who played Lenore, was also in the long-running series Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Which I did not know until you said that. Yeah, I love that show. I never saw it. The line Dean says, sleep all day, party all night, is a reference to the vampire film The Lost Boys, which stars Jason Patrick and Kiefer Sutherland. And it has the famous line, sleep all day, party all night, it's fun to be a vampire. That's uh, actually, I think the, I don't think that's the line. I think that's the movie uh, poster slogan. Yeah, maybe. I can't remember. I mean, it definitely was. It was the slogan, but did Keeper Sutherland maybe yeah, say Yeah, no, he, said, he does. But I think it's not that exact line. I think he says like, sleep all day, party all night, but you must feed. Right. Oh, no. In other words, he goes, you sleep all day, you party all night. You never grow old and you never die, but you must feed. That's what it is. Yep. Yeah. Loved that um, movie growing up. Yeah, me too. And you love Jason Patrick. Oh, I love, big I Jason, love Jason Patrick. Patrick. And you got to be on a boat with him for several I months. I wanted to be on a, I got to be on a boat with him. I did not get to be on a boat with Jamie Gertz. And Jamie Gertz was supposed to be my bride. When I was 15, I decided she and I would start a life together. Wow. And when she met me, she would decide I was the boyish, charming man of her dreams. We would uh, be married and raise a family, and that never happened. So I kind of feel like life is uh, really, wow. well, really ripped me off. Creep, creep show, everybody. Just to check, please. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Side note to Jamie Gertz's security detail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Keep a look um, out for this man. And here's your final fun fact. Sam and Dean pose as reporters from the Weekly World News, an actual newspaper tabloid that often published headlines about the supernatural. One of the most infamous was Bat Boy. Yes. And they go back to the Weekly World News for the basis of an entire episode, Tall Tales, which is the first episode I did uh, as the trickster. It's all about uh, Weekly World News headlines. Uh, wait, is that later this season? Yes. Season two? 
Yes. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That'll be go. exciting. I mean, this is all new to me. Yeah. So anyway, great, great fun. Good, fun episode to talk about. Great um, episode to talk about. Great, great interview. Great interview. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, we appreciate it. We'll see you next time. This episode of Supernatural features Jared Padalecki as Sam Winchester and Jensen Ackles as Dean Winchester. Guest stars include Ty Olson as Eli, Amber Benson as Lenore, and Sterling K. Brown as Gordon. Bloodlust was written by Sarah Gamble, directed by Bob Singer. Editing by Tom McQuaid. Music by Jay Greska. Executive produced by Eric Kripke and Bob Singer. The original broadcast of this episode featured the following songs. Back in Black by ACDC. Wheel in the Sky by Journey. Time and Time Again by Long John Hunter. Golden Rule by Little Ed and the Blues Imperials. And Funny Car Graveyard by Lee Rocker. It's a lot of songs. Dude, that's an expensive episode. Yep. This episode originally aired on October 12th, 2006. This episode of Supernatural Then and Now was hosted and executive produced by Richard Spate Jr. and Rob Benedict. Produced by Stephen Hine. Written by Stephen Hine and Heide Holscher. And edited and associate produced by Trey Boudet. What's up, Booty? Music provided by Tim Wynn. The episode was recorded with the help of Sonic Fuel Studios. This podcast is from Story Mill Media. Follow the podcast on Instagram and Twitter at SPN Then and Now. Can we just go back to the opening of this sentence? Other popular ethical animal blood drinking vampires? Yeah, it's a big Steve. one. Steve. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, hey, guys. <laughs> I have COVID. And now, now we know, going forward, all you have to say is other popular cowitarians. Yeah. Or we could just uh, call it P-E-A-B-D vampires. P-E-A-B-D. P-E-A-B-D. Also, uh, hunters. Vampire hunter. Oh, it's a hunter thing. Oh, I didn't see that part. I should read the question first. Before you start improvising. It was a great job. Hold on. I got to put my, uh, I, I closed up forgetting we had to do all the credits. Um, let me tell you something. I'll tell you right now. It was a great interview. Yeah, we said that. One of our favorites. No, we'll just say it again. Okay. <laughs> One of the best. All right, go uh-huh. on. Story Mill Media. 